today is Mark chapter 11, 22 through 24. Mark 11, 22 through 24. As I talk to you today about only believe. In verse 22, Jesus said to his disciples, have faith in God. In verse 23, he said, I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must, may you, but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. Verse 24, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you pray, if you believe that you receive it, when you pray for anything, if you believe that you receive it, it will be yours. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever sat in a classroom with an instructor explaining how to solve a problem and you thought to yourself, I just don't see it. Maybe, maybe you've had the experience of building a new house and as you stood on the vacant lot, the contractor said, we're going to move this dirt over here. We're going to take these trees out and we're going to fill over here. And we're going to do this and we're going to build up over here. And you're looking at it and you're like, I just don't see it. Maybe the first time you read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You thought to yourself, I just don't see it. Maybe when you read this verse or you heard me read it this morning where Jesus says, you, if you pray anything in my will and, and you believe it with all your heart, you'll have it. Well, whatever you pray for, you're going to have. And, and you thought to yourself, I just don't see it. Well, that's what believing does for us. You see, believing enables us to see the unseen possibilities that God has provided for us. Another word for believing is faith. In fact, Jesus began his statement in verse 22 with the words, have faith in God. Faith defined by Webster's dictionary is confidence or trust in a person or thing. Faith in another's ability. Belief that is not based on proof. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because those who come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, faith provides eyes for our heart or our spirit. That's what faith does. It gives us vision. Faith is, someone once said, faith is the mirror of the heart that reflects the realities of an unseen world. The actual substance of his kingdom through the prayer of faith, we are able to pull the reality of his world into ours. That's why Jesus told us to pray in Matthew 6, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What was Jesus saying? It's by faith in our prayer, we are pulling the kingdom of heaven, the culture of heaven into the culture of planet earth right here. Now, when I read this scripture, have you ever read scripture in the Bible and it intimidated you? Come on, be honest. Just wave at me if you've ever read this. Like, I don't know about that. This scripture is probably the most intimidating. One, it's it's got to be the top five, one of the top five intimidating scriptures in the Bible for me. When Jesus says to me, and he is when I'm reading it, and he is to you when you read it. When he says, you can ask, you can say to that mountain, be removed and cast in the sea. If you don't doubt in your heart, believe that those things which you say will be done, it will be done. When Jesus said that, that intimidates me. And sometimes I think, well, maybe, maybe that'll work for somebody somewhere at some time, but not for me. But the reality is, is that Jesus was talking to everybody. And that means he's talking to you and he's talking to the person next to you. And he's talking to you right now. And right now he's stirring your faith and he's challenging your faith to believe him. He's challenged your faith to step out a little further in what do you see and allowing God to help you to see the realities of the spiritual realm coming into the natural realm. That's what Jesus did is he, he, he modeled that on planet earth in the years of his ministry here. He modeled what it was like to bring that spirit realm and the kingdom of heaven on planet earth. He began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's, that was his message in Matthew chapter four. That's what he began to preach. And that was his message all the way through. The kingdom of heaven is here. Now that's, that's the realities of God's kingdom in this world where we live right now. 
Let's look at some faith realities. Number one, faith lives within the revealed will of God. Say that with me. Faith lives within the revealed will of God. 1 John 5, 14 through 15 says this. 1 John 5, 14 through 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, everybody say whatever. whatever. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. You see, faith lives within the revealed word of God. In other words, we will not be able to believe God beyond our knowledge of him or what we know about him. That's why knowing the word, that's why the Bible said, Jesus says in John chapter eight, you will know the truth. What's the rest of it? And the truth will set you free. But here's something we have to understand. It's only the truth you know that sets you free. If, if you don't know the truth, the, 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 ver, the, the, the reverse of that is if you don't know the truth, you, you won't be set free. You can't be set free unless you know the truth. Back to my statement, faith, faith is, is part of, faith is with, is lives within the revealed will of God. There's so many misconceptions and false information about God that restricts and limits or nullifies our faith. For example, if you believe, if someone believes that God does not love them, is that, is that contrary to the word of God? Of course it is. For God so loved the world. God is love. The, the, the Bible is full of scriptures and truth that reveal the love of God for us. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Uh, the love of God, the things that God will do to extend his love to us. They, they, they never cease to amaze me when I read the word of God. And every time, just like this past week, as reading about the crucifixion, as Jesus was arrested and, and, and he stands there and the, and the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests have people to come up and lie about him. Things never change, do they? Just turn the news on. You see the same thing today. They, they hire people to lie about him and still they couldn't, couldn't, couldn't convince them. You know, when people start lying, it's hard for them to get their stories right. Same thing. It never changes. And Jesus stood there. He took all of that. And finally they asked him, says, well, listen, are, are you the son of God? The, the, the promised one, the blessed one, he says, I am. And it won't be long. You'll see me seated at the right hand of the Father. The chief priest tore his clothes, says, well, he's blaspheming God. What more do we need? What do you folks say? They said, crucify him. And Jesus took it for me. But you know what? If you believe that God does not love you, if you listen to the lies of the enemy, if you listen to the lies of people, if you listen to the lies of false preachers, if you listen to the lies of false theology and things and, and philosophy that's contrary to the Word of God, there's a lot of good philosophical books and things like that out there to read. But if it's contrary to the Word of God, it's an evil report. Just like the spies, they brought back an evil report. See, if you don't believe that God loves you, what will happen? You won't experience the love of God in your life. It's there. You just won't experience because you don't believe it. How about God wants me to be poor? Well, if you believe that, then you won't take any of the access of the scriptures and the word of God where God wants to bless you and help you. There'll be no faith to receive any increase in your life. You'll live that way. And there's some people that believe that. They believe that. that they, that's, they take a couple of scriptures and they say, well, that's what I'm going to base my life on. I think we need to base it on Genesis through Revelation and what the word of God has for us. But God, well, God wants me to be sick. See, we just go down a lot of things. God, well, I know God wants me to be there. Why does it? Well, because that's what I've been taught. Really? Do you want your children to be sick? Are you God's child? I'm asking a question. Are you, are you a child of God? Anybody here a child of God? Is anybody here a child of God? Okay. Well, anybody here have any children? Do you want your children to be sick? Well, I don't think so. If you do, there's something wrong with you. Really? You need some help. Yeah. Something wrong if you want your children sick. Well, if you're a child of God and if he loves you more than you love your children and he does, he doesn't want you sick. Sickness is a part of, of the sin in, in, in the Garden of Eden, the fall of mankind. 
Yeah, we have to deal with it. It's a reality. Thank God for doctors and surgeons and medicine and all of that stuff. Thank God for all of that. Thank God for all of you that are in the medical realm. God, is, God, God has gifted us with you uh, to, to help in, in, in that area. But that's not the only thing. He sent his word in Psalm 120. He sent his word and healed them. Jesus, Jesus on his stripes, on his back, he, he bore sickness and disease for us. Everywhere Jesus went, he went about doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. But see, if you believe that God wants you to sick, guess what? You won't walk in that truth. You won't have faith to believe God for that at all. I don't have all the answers to anything in the Word of God, let alone one particular area, but I do have one big answer. That is that God is God and His Word is true and I choose to believe His Word. How about you? See, unbelief is anchored in what is visible or reasonable apart from God. That, that's what our unbelief is anchored in. What's, what's, what's reasonable and visible apart from God. It honors the natural realm as superior to the Word of God. In other words, what we see is superior to what we can know through the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 18, the last part of it says this, for the things which are seen are temporary. Everybody say temporary. But the things which are not seen are what? They're eternal. God, God created, before this world was, God was. So his principles, his word, his power, his promises supersede the physical that we see today. Now, this verse is not suggesting that what we see around us is not important. I'm not saying that at all. Everything in the natural realm reflects the greatness of God for us to see. And this is where we live, by the way. However, if we live only by what we see, we will never experience the divine opportunities of God. For they are seen or seized through the eyes of faith. I was waiting for an amen right there. I don't know. You see, we don't, we don't possess the things of God by just knowledge. We, we possess them by action, by believing, by acting on that knowledge and choosing to believe. Because we're going to believe something. Everybody's believing something. Don't kid yourself. We're all believing something. So we choose what we believe. Here's the second thing today. Faith is the mirror of the heart. I quoted Hebrews 11.1 1 a few moments ago. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Here's a quote for you. Mirror, faith is the mirror of the heart that reflects the realities of his world into ours. Say it again. Faith is the mirror of the heart. It's the mirror of the heart that reflects the realities of his world, the kingdom of heaven into ours. In Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 13, Jesus teaches us the principles of prayer. I mentioned it a moment ago, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Jesus is teaching us to pray for what we cannot see, to come into the realm where we live today, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So he said, I want you to pray for something you cannot see to come into a place that you can see. That's what he's saying. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is not moved Here's, here's something you have, have to understand. Heaven is not moved by our need. He's moved by our faith. Somebody says, well, if God really loved everybody, why are these people suffering over here? And why are these people doing it? Why is there a famine over here? And why do these people don't have any water over here? Why do these? Well, because he's put us on planet earth to know his word, to accept his word, to believe his word, to act on his word, and go meet those needs of those people. See, that's, that's part of that. God, God has done something about it. He put you and I here to do something about it. See, he is doing something about it. He's provided every resource that there is. But God does not, just because we have a need, it does not release the kingdom of heaven into our lives. And when I, I began to realize this as a, as a young, young man, I, it began to change my world because I thought, well, I, I have all this need. God ought to do something for me. Anybody decided to me ever felt that way? You know, after all, I'm, I'm in so much pain, God ought to do something. I mean, look at what my family's gone. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. It's like, well, well we're all, we've got all this pain. I'm, that means I'm, I, I must be bumped up to the top of the list. <laughs> I, I might be in the top 10 of prayers getting answered today because, man, I really got a need. 
Yeah. I'm the neediest, so I, I, must, I must be going to get my prayer. And, and we equate it to like our children. Which child do you pick up first? The loudest, right. The one that's crying the most. We, we even have a saying, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I mean, that, see, it's our, that's our mentality, see, on planet Earth. But it doesn't work that way with heaven. The more we cry and complain, the more God will say, oh, well, shucks. I just feel sorry for them. I'm going to help them. It doesn't work that way. No, God responds to faith. Believing faith, believing him, standing on his word. He's given us his word to learn, to, to hide in our hearts, to speak, to declare, to reveal himself to us. As we pray, the reality of heaven's principles and power becomes real to us. When they become a reality in our heart, then they can become a reality in our lives. The third thing is that faith is born of the spirit. Romans 10, 10 says, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. With the heart, with the heart. You know, I lead people in a salvation prayer almost every week. But you can pray a prayer, you can repeat a prayer to somebody and not mean it and nothing will happen. True. See, it has to be a heart connection. It says if the heart, it's with the heart one believes. Uh, uh, when you see the word heart in the Bible, it's referring to our spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. We live in a body. We have a soul, which is our mind, our will, our intellect, our emotions. And we are a spirit. We are a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. We're a triune being created in the image of God, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. When the Bible says we're created in the image of God, that's the image of God. Everything in the universe is based on that same principle. If you remember from science class, an atom has three parts to it. And atoms make up everything at three parts. Everything reflects the, the image of God. And so we are a spirit. And when, it's, when you see the word heart, it's speaking to our spirit. It's our spirit, the, the eternal part of us, that spirit and soul part of our lives. Faith is neither intellectual nor anti-intellectual. It is superior to intellect. Uh, we, we don't have to check our brain at the door when we come into church. Uh, we, we, don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to do that. God wants us to, He gave us our mind. He gave us our brain to use. But we can't make that superior to His Word. You see, faith, through faith we're able to come into agreement with the mind and the will of God. When we submit the things of God to the mind of man, when we take the Word of God and we submit it, in other words, we subject it to the authority of the mind of man Unbelief and religious form without function or life are the results. We can take the Word of God and submit it to the mind of man, and we can come up with all kinds of religious hoops and, and things to do and, and ceremonies and ritualistic, and that's what we see in many religions. It's, it's all form without life. Having, the Bible says it this way, having a form of godliness but denying the power. But when we submit the mind of man to the things of God, we have faith and a renewed mind. Here's the quote for you. The mind makes a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. I'll let you think about that for about two seconds. In our personal lives, we can accomplish a lot of things if we have determination, if we have a good work ethic, if we have good management skills, but without faith, we can never accomplish God's goals. Yeah, you can have a good family. You can make a good living. You can save money and have a decent retirement. You can do all those things but you still got to have God's help because you got to have his air to breathe. You got to have strength. You know. but, 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 but we can take our skills and we can accomplish some things, but we can never accomplish God things without faith. We can never get saved without faith. We can go to church. We can join a church. We can be baptized three different ways. We, we, can, we, we can sing in the choir if there was one. We can, we can be on a worship team. We can, we, can, we can do everything. We can work, 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 go through all the classes. We can achieve the different levels of discipleship and all that, those things. But if we never gave our heart to Jesus, if we never believed in his word, it would all just be something to do. It'd be nothing more than a religious hobby. And that's what it is to some people. They don't even realize it because they've never come to an understanding that, that, that Jesus paid the price for their salvation on Calvary. And it's only through him that we can be saved. It's only through his sacrifice that you and I and the grace of God, we can never earn it. Never earn it. Are we supposed to work and do and, and, and be good stewards? Yes, 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 yes. But, but that's the byproduct of having that relationship with Jesus. You see, the, the, greatest, the greatest thing that God wants, I believe, is to be believed. 
The greatest single thing God wants is to be believed. Do you want to believe? Do you want to be believed? Do you want people to trust you and believe you? Does it infuriate you when somebody calls you a liar? Oh, it's one of the things that really makes me fighting mad. There's very few things, but when somebody calls me a liar, you know why? Because I value my integrity. You know, when we say, I don't believe the word of God, we're calling God a liar. You think God values his integrity? In fact, the Bible tells us God is not a man that he should lie. And in fact, the father of lies is Satan himself. You know, in the early 1900s, a pastor and evangelist by the name of Paul Rader, he actually pastored the Moody Church up in Chicago for a while. He wrote a song entitled, Only Believe. And the simple words of the chorus go like this, Only believe, only believe. All things are possible, only believe. Now that song has been sung a bazillion times throughout, throughout the last century. He wrote it in the first part of the 19th. What a wonderful song. What a simplistic song. Only believe, only believe, all things are possible. Only believe. Where did that come from? <laughs> I think it came from Mark 11. Only believe. And yet sometimes in our life that seems to be the most difficult thing to do. Here's what helps me. When I have trouble believing, it's because I'm having trouble thinking too much. It's like Jairus said to Jesus when, when, when they were going to his house to heal his daughter and word came from his house that don't bother him anymore because, because your daughter just died. There's no point in having Jesus come pray for her now because she's dead. In other words, they placed a limit on what Jesus could do. And that's what we do as well. Jesus, obviously seeing the look on Jairus' face, this dad who just heard news of his daughter dying, and the stress on his face, Jesus looked at him and says, only believe. All things are possible to those who believe. And Jairus responded back, Lord, I believe. The King James says, help thou mine unbelief. What he was saying was, help, I, I'm believing, but I've got some unbelief I'm struggling with. You know what I, I really think he was doing? I think he's doing what you and I do sometimes. In his heart, he knew that Jesus could do anything, including raising his daughter from the dead. He knew that. In his heart, he knew that. He knew that. How many of you believe that Jesus can do anything right now? I mean, in your heart, you believe that he can do anything. He can do anything. Anything, anything, anything. He can, he can, he can, he can do anything, anything, anything. Well, what about your head? I think Jairus is saying, Lord, I believe, but my head is wanting to argue. Because see, my head has never seen anybody raised from the dead, let alone my own daughter. My, my, my head is never, my, my head can't conceptualize that. My head can't, can't intellectualize it. I can't, I can't diagram it like a sentence. I can't put it in a mathematical equation. I can't, I can't take uh, uh, chemical symbols and, 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 and symbolize it. I, from, from the known world and the scientific world, I, I, can't, I can't write it out in literature. I can't, I, can't, I can't put a puzzle together and make it look right. There's my mind, my mind struggling with this, but in my heart, I believe. Do you know that Jesus didn't rebuke him? He didn't say, well, I'm sorry, boy. If you can't get it all together, I'm not going to your house. He just turned and walked to the house. That was enough. All I need you to do is believe in your heart and submit your mind to your heart belief. In other words, put what's in your heart above what's in your mind. Maybe you can't get those doubts out up here. Maybe you can't get that. I don't understand that up here. But down in here, you can put this first above that. I believe that's what Jairus was struggling with. That's what we struggle with today in our hearts and in our lives. But you don't have to struggle with it. Jesus is greater than anything, and you can believe his word. Do you believe that today? I said, do you believe that today? Well, what is it that you need right now then that's, that's big? What is it that perhaps you've been praying for and you quit praying for because it just didn't happen in your life? 
Or maybe you haven't prayed for it because you thought it was too big to pray for. What is it that you're facing right now in your life? Because you folks know I'm a practicalist. I'm not a theorist. There's no point in talking about this if we're not going to put it in action in our lives. See, I still believe Mark 11, 23 and 24. I believe what Jesus said in verse 22, have faith in God. That's where it all starts, is faith in God. And let me, let me frame it this way, more faith in God than in anything else. Do I have faith in different things? I have faith that my vehicle will start out there. I do. Even though it's a Ford, I have faith that it will start. <laughs> oh, you should be pre people appreciate that. Yeah, I know. But just call me if you need a pull. I, I have faith my wife loves me. I have faith if she's in the kitchen then something good's going to come out of the kitchen. <laughs> I have faith in a lot of things and so do you. Don't you? Don't you? You, you? you wouldn't go to the doctor's appointment tomorrow if you didn't have faith that the doctor and the nurse was going to do something for you. I, I, have, I, have, a, I have a physician. I have faith in him that he knows pretty much what he's doing and he's going to do his best to help me. And he can read reports that I can't read because he's been educated in that area. I have faith in that. I do. I don't have faith that they're going to get my order right through the drive through but that's another <laughs> thing. I, I just don't, I don't have any faith for that. I'm happy when it happens, but I don't have any faith in that. But back to the things we do have faith in. There's some things I have faith in. There's some things you have faith in. But do you have faith in God? Because you see, we all have a limit. Now listen to me. I'm trying to help you here and I'm helping me. We all have a limit as to how far we trust God. And do you know, Rose said something earlier up here about, you know, if you don't have a need, you don't need a miracle. Did you know that's one of the reasons in our lives we go through difficult times is God wants to stretch our faith and God wants to show us that he's bigger than what we believe him to be. And that his grace is more than we thought it was. And his love is broader than we ever believed. And he could comfort in places we didn't think he could comfort. And he could answer in areas that we didn't think he could answer. Listen, life is a journey. A relationship with Jesus is a journey. It's not like I get saved, I'm going to try to do right for the next 50 years and then go to heaven. Oh, no, 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 no. It's a journey. It's a walk. The disciples walked with Jesus. They had new experiences every day. And sometimes it was tough and sometimes it was difficult. And, and man, the storms blew and Jesus showed them he could walk on water. And one of them decided he would too. You, you see, that's, that's part of the great life with Jesus. That's, that's part of our great and wonderful life with him is that we may not know today what we'll know tomorrow, but tomorrow's coming. We, we may not understand everything right now, but we've got another day to learn. Walk in what we understand right now and what we know. Your knowledge of God has expanded this morning in the last 30 minutes if you've been listening and paying attention. Because, not because I said something important, but because while I was preaching, the Holy Spirit said something important on the inside of you. Something lodged on the inside of you in your mind, your intellect, and your spirit. And God is causing faith to rise a little bit. The faith level is rising in your heart, in your life right now. What are you facing? I want to end in prayer here in a moment. And I want to pray with you. What are you facing right now that you want to put out there and begin to believe God for? What mountain do you need to move in your life? I've never seen a mountain anywhere on planet earth that I, need, I needed to say, mountain, come up from there and go over there. I've never seen that. And that's what Jesus is using that as an illustration, but he's not saying you need to move physical mountains. What he's saying is, what are the mountains in your life? You know, what are the mountains of sickness and disease? What are the mountains of finances? What are the mountains of fear? What are the mountains of, of, of frustration? What are the mountains in your life that you're facing in a family situation? What, the mountains of hurt and pain on the inside. You know, pain, internal pain and hurt can be one of the biggest mountains and nobody sees it but you. It's like these islands, they're underwater. The biggest part of the mountain is underwater. All they see is just the top coming out. What is it you're facing? What mountain do you need to address today in your life? Maybe you've got unsaved loved ones and it's like a mountain. Like they don't pay a bit of attention to you whatsoever. 
whatsoever. They don't pay attention to you whatsoever. I'm going to steal a little bit of Rose's Thunder illustration. We'll use it real quick here. But for years and years, her daddy, we, we pastored 30, 35 miles from where he lived. He never came to church one time. Not one time. Not one time did he come see his daughter, son of his grand in church. Not one time did he ever come. Didn't have time for God, anything else. Well, we prayed and she prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And her, and her brother's the same way. Prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Prayed and prayed. Today they're all saved. They're all saved. They go to church together and this past week in Rose's at the hospital with her daddy, one of the deacons of the church came and just bragged on her brother and all his family. So they fill up a pew and a half, all their kids and grandkids and everything and how they work in the church and how they do and everything. But one of the unique things was she was with her daddy there and, and, for his, and he'd just come out of surgery and she's with him there and the nurse came in and talked to him and whatnot. And he said to the nurse, said, do you go to church anywhere? She found out later on from her brother that he does that a lot. Does that a lot when he takes him to the doctor. He asks him, do you go to church? Well, you need to go. Because a few years ago, standing right there, he gave his heart to the Lord. I led him in a salvation prayer right there at the end of the service like I'm going to do here in just a minute. He gave his heart to the Lord. He may not be, ever be a spiritual giant. He may not be an intercessor, a world-renowned intercessor. But he's genuinely born again and saved and he's got proof of it to show it and, and is concerned about other people. It was a mountain. For many years, it was a mountain. It was a mountain. It's like, is this ever going to change? It was a mountain. And then, what mountain do you need to speak to in your life right now? No matter what it is. Your faith is rising right now. All of a sudden, you kind of believe sort of that God can do something. Guess what? He can. He can. He can. He's waiting on you to partner with him. He's waiting on you to invite him. He's waiting on you to say like Peter, if that's you walking on the water, I want to walk on the water too. All the rest of them just sat in the boat like, nah, I'm not doing that. But Peter got it. So, all right then, if you can do it, Jesus, Jesus, what, what the principle of that is, Jesus said, if I can do it, you can do it. Paul understood it and said it in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Bad things happen in life. Tragedies happen in the world. We live in a life in a, in a world where Satan is still wreaking havoc. But we have a high priest called Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father that ever lives to intercede for us. He's given us his word. And he's saying, you take my word and you speak my word and you declare that mountain in your life. What mountain are you facing right now? I want to pray with you this very moment in this place and agree together. I want you right there where you are to begin to speak to that mountain. Whatever it is, I'm not going to start naming mountains. We don't have time for that today. You know what you're facing right now. You know if you're watching by live streaming today. You know what you're dealing with. You know what you're facing. Let your spirit rise and connect right now on the inside. Believe like Jairus. Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Begin to speak to that right now. Begin to call as the Bible says, those things that are not as though they were. The things in the natural, begin to call them what you need them to be in the spirit realm in your heart and life. And like Jesus said here, if you will believe, all things are possible to those who believe. Let's pray together. Father, I join with my family right now. I join in faith with them right now, believing. Every person I believe has a mountain. Some of them have a mountain range. There's so many mountains, Lord, they're facing. But Father, none of them are as big as you. They're not even close. And I pray, Holy Spirit, right now in this place for faith to be ignited in the heart of every individual. I pray, God, today for those things, those mountains, those walls, those barriers, those challenges, those hurts, those pains. I pray, God, as Pastor Chad preached last week about miracles and the possibility of divine intervention in, your life, in our lives. I pray, God, today that you would release those miracles in people's lives. I pray today, God, that there would be a divine intervention, a divine flow of your presence into our hearts, into our minds, into our intellect. Open the eyes of our understanding according to Ephesians chapter 1. 
that we would know the hope of our calling in you, God. Lord, let our faith level rise as our word level is rising, reading through the word of God this year. Lord, I pray that every stronghold, every bondage that is a mountain be broken over people's lives now. I pray for the mountains of sickness and disease to be cast into the sea of forgetfulness. I pray, God, for the mountains of relationship heartache, God, and broken hearts and betrayals and denials, Lord. I pray for that to be cast into the sea. I pray today, Lord, for people who's facing financial challenges, God. Not only do we need wisdom, understanding, and direction, openings for jobs, and, and, and how to manage what we have, and, and those who need better jobs or a job. I pray, God, that that barrier of mountain be thrown into the sea, and that new opportunities would come, and new breakthroughs would come, and new ideas for business people would come, and, and new creative ideas and management would come. I pray, God, today, Lord, for your divine grace, your love, your faith, your power to be released into our lives today to accomplish your will in our homes, our families, in our lives, in our children, in our parents, our grandparents, God, in every area of our family. And we thank you, God. All things are possible. Only, only, only believe. Only believe, Lord. Only. Help us to only believe. To focus on that one thing, to believe in Jesus' name we pray today, and if you prayed that prayer with me, and you are believing God today, and you're stretching your faith today, and you're putting into practice today what God has put in your heart today, shout a big amen right now. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise here this morning and thank Him in this place.